Thank you so much for clicking on this video. I know your time is important, so I'll try to make this easy. If you don't have the time or attention to listen right now, please save the video, come back later, because if you are a seeker of truth, you should not let this pass you by. The contents of this presentation are a distillation of a book that is in pre-order or on sale if you are from the future. This is not a sales pitch, however, you will find no cliffhanger or unfinished tale here. While this presentation cannot suffice as a replacement for that book, it does suffice as a complete introduction to those who simply want to know what this whole thing is about. My ambition is first and foremost to get these ideas out into the world, and though the subject suits a book, I want this shortened form to exist as well. The goal of this work, as the title suggests, is to establish the foundations of a genuine philosophical science called parapholosophy. Not a pop science, or a bro science, or a pseudoscience, but a genuine academic discipline that will be studied and taught within the university. The basis of this science is an analysis of the ideas philosophers have come up with in their attempts to rationalise our experience of the world. If we can demonstrate that the structure defining these ideas exists objectively, then we have a science that talks about the structure of reality at a fundamental level. Now, philosophers have been providing us with their perspectives on basic philosophical notions for a long time, and we have a reservoir of beliefs and theories to analyse. A qualifying mark of a philosophical theory is that we don't know whether it is true, only whether it is reasonable. This has always been the case, there is always an antithesis to each and every thesis. More importantly, for each idea based on a third-person, objective viewpoint, there is an equally reasonable and conflicting idea based on a first-person, subjective viewpoint. This duality of perspectives is inherent in the questions we ask, so that we cannot resolve philosophical problems via discrimination alone. When we combine the idea that each and every question has a single consistent answer with the recognition that opposing answers cannot be discriminated between, we preclude ourselves from making progress in philosophy. The law of non-contradiction is reasonable because there are no contradictions in our perceptions. We communicate on the basis of distinction, and we act intentionally on the basis of discrimination. Thus, it is reasonable that the subject must be reduced to the object, or vice versa, so that our conceptions may align with a single, consistent world. Otherwise, we would have not just one world, but rather two, as expressed, for example, by René Descartes' substance dualism between mind and matter. The problem with this view is that any interaction between worlds must be reconciled with modern physics, and the idea that physical processes must be explained and understood purely in terms of physical theories. If we believe that physics precludes ideal causation, then dualism is not a parsimonious theory. And if our experience of a categorical duality between thoughts and things is not fundamental, then our experience contains things the real world does not. In any case, we do not believe that the mind is a mirror of our environment, since there are properties of our perception that are not required to describe it at a low level, properties like colour or smell. There are also properties found in scientific theories which we don't perceive, like quarks or mathematical concepts. In the 18th century, David Hume propounded that the validity of empirical science, and particularly the causal connections between events, cannot be, on pain of circularity, justified via empirical science. It is subjective. Immanuel Kant saved us from this scepticism by reasoning that science studies phenomena, not that which phenomena are grounded in, and phenomena are conditioned by the structure of the human subject. Accordingly, Science is reliable, but it does not talk about the world at a fundamental, experience-transcendent level. And since our intuitions of the world determine how it is represented to us, they can never go beyond themselves to conceive of the world in its natural state. When we try, as I mentioned already, we find always that we can approach the problem from a subjective or an objective perspective, and these perspectives interminably contradict each other. If we deny that there is some more fundamental world laying beyond the realm of appearances in which these contradictions of the intellect are resolved, yet we accept Kant's diagnosis that the mind contributes to the appearance of the world, then we are forced to accept that the contradictions are real, and that contradictory perspectives are true simultaneously. Instinctively, of course, this is not a popular perspective, for it violates the basic tenets of logic on which our thinking is built, 
But there is another way to characterise opposition, and it is much less contentious, complementary opposition, wherein opposites are not antagonistic but are rather reciprocal. Complementarity was made famous in the Western academic sphere through Niels Bohr, who used it to describe the contradictory co-presence of a particle and wave nature to matter and light, and the quantum properties they affect, such as position and momentum, or coherence and entanglement. Complementarity has also been an important concept in depth psychology, first through William James and later by Carl Jung. Both of these men described a duality of perspectives found in various scientific and artistic disciplines, and they posited that a thinker's temperament and attitude is largely determinant of their perspective on matters of philosophy. They recognised two basic kinds of attitude, for James, the rationalist and the empiricist, and for Jung, the introvert and the extrovert, which he saw to be generally equivalent to the former. The introverted type are they whose attention is directed inwards, to subjective principles and to the abstractions of the unconscious mind. The extroverted are they whose attention is directed outwards, towards objective facts and concrete data. Jung also recognised two basic types of judgement, or two rational functions. The feeling function makes judgments based on the connections between principles, intuitions, emotions, and their impact on the wider environment, while the thinking function makes judgments based on the distinctions in evidence, information, and the ability to discriminate rationally between them. These four functions will reveal themselves to be fundamentally involved in a methodology we can use to classify philosophical perspectives. If we present the two dichotomies as a quadrant diagram, then we can derive four basic classes of intellectual activity – introverted thinking, extroverted thinking, introverted feeling, and extroverted feeling. We can also develop this model without reference to psychological functions, but this will not be necessary for this short presentation. For purposes of simplicity, let us refer to each of these styles of thinking as abjectivism, objectivism, subjectivism, and superjectivism respectively, though I will also omit a detailed explanation of why these terms are suitable. The resultant structure I refer to as the dialectical matrix, and what we find is that the central concepts in all of the major areas of philosophy can be defined by properties that correspond to this matrix. As such, the structure defines the extent of our belief capacity, or the possible perspectives we might have in regard to these various topics. The topics and concepts examined are epistemology and knowledge, ontology and being, axiology and value, political theory and right. A satisfactory analysis of these topics would take some time, so here I provide only a brief summation. For epistemology, our dichotomies are between a priori and a posteriori, and analytic and synthetic. When combined, these dichotomies give us the four classes of knowledge, which, in slightly more natural language, are our intuitional rational truths, our intuitional empirical truths, our logical, rational truths, and finally, the seemingly impossible, logical, empirical truths. For ontology, our dichotomies are between abstract and concrete, and universal and particular. When combined, these dichotomies give us the four classes of being. The first three could be things like properties, material objects, and ideas respectively, but the fourth is also much an impossibility though the universe as a whole is a reasonable suggestion for an entity that is both concrete and universal. For axiology, our dichotomies are between objective and subjective, absolute and relative. These give rise to the positions commonly referred to as value pluralism, moral relativism, moral objectivism, and ideal observer theory. The latter, which is both subjectivist and absolutist, is a normative impossibility, since moral truth would be simply whatever an ideal observer approves of, and an ideal observer would be simply whoever approves of only moral truths. This, of course, is circular. Finally, for political theory, our dichotomies are between authoritarian and libertarian, and collective and individual notions of right. The combination of these dichotomies provides the basis of the politico-theoretical extremes state capitalism, anarcho-capitalism, state socialism, and anarcho-socialism. 
The dialectical matrix can here be understood as distinguishing the expression of the complementary social values, equality on one axis, and liberty on the other. State capitalism balances both of these values but maximises neither. Anarcho-capitalism maximises liberty but minimises equality. State socialism maximises equality but minimises liberty, and anarcho-socialism attempts to maximise both equality and liberty, which on most accounts is a practical impossibility. That is, equality and liberty are antagonistic, for there must be intervention by an authority to cultivate and sustain equality, thus violating liberty, and if there is liberty, then each individual is free to become unequal to their neighbour. The anarcho-socialist society requires each individual to be equal by their own will and would fall apart without such ideal morality. So, now we have determined that there is a uniform structure underlying the concepts and theories of the four major branches of philosophy, and with the dialectical matrix as a foundation, we are able to study the relations between distinct philosophical ideas. Syntheology is the name given to such a study, and there are many ways in which syntheology is useful. For one, it provides a framework through which theories can be developed, and particularly hypothetical theories that have not yet been conceived. Moreover, insofar as syntheology reveals correlations, or isomorphisms, between ideas from different topics of discourse, we are able to talk about particular philosophical ideas as manifestations of particular parts of the structure as a whole. These parts we have already labelled abjectivism, objectivism, subjectivism, and superjectivism respectively, and syntheology reveals that each encapsulates a consistent worldview built of the combinations of philosophical theories from various areas of discourse. Objectivism manifests as thinking-based judgement and extroverted attention, forming an inductive, fragmentalistic, and collaborative methodology that is oriented by the external. In epistemology, the focus is on the synthetic a posteriori, on empiricism. In ontology, it is on concrete particulars, the material world. In axiology, it concerns subjective relative value, and in political theory, it manifests as anarcho-capitalism and an exclusive focus on liberty. Directly opposing objectivism, subjectivism manifests as feeling-based judgement and introverted attention, which form a deductive, holistic, and independent methodology that is oriented by the internal. In epistemology, the focus is on the analytic a priori, on pure logic, in ontology, it is on abstract universals, the domain of ideas and qualities. In axiology, it concerns objective absolute value. And in political theory, it manifests as state socialism and an exclusive focus on equality. Next, we have abjectivism, which manifests as thinking-based judgment and introverted attention, forming an intuitive, fragmentalistic, yet independent methodology with a focus on internal principles. In epistemology, this is expressed through the synthetic a priori, particularly mathematics. In ontology, the focus is on abstract particulars, like numbers. In axiology, it concerns objective relative value. And in political theory, it manifests as state capitalism, and the attempt to find a compromising balance between liberty and equality, respectively. Finally, we have superjectivism which manifests as feeling-based judgement and extroverted attention. Unlike the previous three classes, this one appears to consist of the combinations of antithetical, contradictory, or perhaps complementary properties. In epistemology, this is the analytic a posteriori. In ontology, the concrete universal. In axiology, the subjective absolute. And in political theory, it is the co-instantiation of liberty and equality libertarianism and collectivism under anarcho-socialism. Whereas abjectivism seeks to reduce the complementarity or contradiction between the subject and object, superjectivism seeks to unite the opposites within a single form. Thus, the perspective is often found to be innately paradoxical, circular, or otherwise self-defeating. Note also that both abjectivism and superjectivism are neutral in regard to subjective and objective factors, and differ only in how this neutrality is expressed. 
Objectivism and subjectivism represent the standard theoretical duality that we find throughout philosophy, and are accordingly biased or one-sided perspectives. They largely correspond to what William James called tough-minded empiricism and tender-minded rationalism, and to what Young called concrete and abstract thinking, respectively. Now, if we are to maintain that each of these ideologies contradicts the others, and if contradictions are impossible, then only one of these ideologies may be true, and the others must be false. Of course, a combination of positions from multiple ideologies may be the truth, but for simplicity's sake, let us assume that these ideologies are fused together as single wholes. This is a reasonable request, because we have just shown that the possible perspectives to take on a topic are not chaotic and disorderly, but conform to a uniform structure. This structure is the structure of something, and we want to discover what that something is. In order to achieve this goal, we must understand the nature of our rationale to demarcate the structure and to present its components as competitors. We must understand the logic by which truth is ascribed either to an idea or its negation, and we must reassure ourselves that our logic is independent from the structure we allow it to govern. Now, there are in particular three logical rules that have governed our intellectual endeavours over the millennia, and these were first identified by Aristotle in the 4th century BCE. The law of identity states that a thing is what it is, that every term has a definition. The law of non-contradiction states that nothing is and is not, that contradictory propositions cannot be true simultaneously, and thirdly, the law of excluded middle states that everything is or is not, that contradictory propositions cannot be untrue simultaneously. These are the so-called laws of thought, for they are required for all intelligent thinking. By these simple rules alone, we can achieve incredible things, and the whole of classical logic is based upon them. Aristotle's term logic remained largely unchanged and unchallenged for over 2,000 years, and in the mid-19th century, the mathematician George Boole disentangled the terms of logic from the metaphysical objects they referred to, and so was born the field of mathematical logic, where deductions are made through the means of symbols alone. Boole's logic algebraized the laws of thought and provided a method to symbolise collections of objects possessing similar attributes. The violation of the law of non-contradiction was given the symbol zero, while the adherence to the law of excluded middle was given the symbol one. These now famous objects express that which does not and which does exist respectively, and the architecture of all modern computing, along with all binary programming languages and our age of information, is grounded in Boole's, and by extension Aristotle's, logic. Zero and one, off and on, false and true, black and white. These would be our options, and these options would be the lens of our thinking both as ancient Greeks and as modern, developed, technologically integrated men and women. If we ascribe either of these predicates to any idea or theory, then we must ascribe the other to its contradiction. This logic would be used to provide a foundation for the whole of mathematics, so that all mathematical truths could be shown to be necessitated by self-evident rules, this was Gottlob Frege's logicist program, which defined all objects in terms of extensions, or sets, which are simply the collections of objects particular concepts describe. At the turn of the 20th century, Frege's program appeared successful, but in 1902 a catastrophic problem was found within the theory, courtesy of Bertrand Russell. Given that all properties have sets, we can define the set expressing the property of self-exclusion, and moreover, we can define the set expressing the property of being a set, expressing the property of self-exclusion. We can thus define a set whose members are precisely those sets that do not contain themselves as members. The problem arises when we ask whether this set contains itself or not. If it does, then it doesn't, and if it doesn't, then it does. Accordingly, either some propositions, such as the set of all self-exclusive sets excludes itself, are not solely true or false, contradicting classical logic, or else not all properties, such as being a self-exclusive set, have corresponding sets, contradicting the concept of a set. Naturally, it is the second conclusion that was taken by mathematicians, and new formulations of set theory emerged that restricted how we can collect objects together. 
If any concept whose collection would contain itself was disallowed, then we could avoid all possible instances of self-referential paradox. There are drawbacks to this solution, however. For one, since not all concepts would have sets, we need to introduce rules that govern how sets are to be constructed, and since these rules are not derived from laws of logic, mathematics becomes an exercise of intuition again. More importantly, however, the basic language of mathematics becomes stratified, which means that it diverges from the logic of natural language, of speech. That is, this kind of solution bans self-reference outright, but self-reference in natural language is necessary, such as with the word I. Since the same self-referential paradoxes occur in natural language, the stratification of any language is not a true solution for them. These paradoxes have been known for thousands of years and are all ultimately based on the same form, most succinctly expressed by the liar paradox, this statement is false. Regardless of the synthetic nature of the rules we must introduce to build sets, in the 1920s self-reference was found to be impossible to completely eliminate in principle. Famously, Kurt Gödel used a method of encoding to insert a proposition into itself, and the proposition he used was a syntactical version of the liar paradox, expressing this proposition is unprovable. According to the formalist understanding of the truth predicate, a true sentence is one that can be derived from the axioms of some theory. However, Gödel's sentence must be true, for if it were false, it would then be provably unprovable, which is a contradiction. Gödel's sentence is therefore unprovably true, revealing a distinction between truth and provability, and revealing that not all true statements can be produced by a given theory. The transcendence of truth is not a necessary conclusion, however, though it is one that is required by classical logic. If we are willing to dispose of classical logic, we can retain an equivalence between truth and provability, and we have, generally, two options for this. If we assert that the fact we cannot prove the Gödel sentence means it cannot be considered true, then we must assert that it is neither true nor false, since if it were false, it would be provable. This position would make sense in the context of the belief that mathematics is a creation of the mind, since only when a statement is constructed may we consider it real and thus to have a truth value. Alternatively, if we assert that the fact we can see the Gödel sentence is true by necessity means that it must be provable, then we assert that it is both true and false, for if it is true and provable, then it is unprovable and false. This position would make sense in the context of the belief that mathematics is objective, analytic, and therefore discovered, since all mathematical truths could be reached by logic alone, perhaps via Frege's original theory. You may have noticed, however, that these options require the violation of one of the laws of thought. The incomplete approach requires violating the law of excluded middle, for not all sentences are true or false, and the inconsistent approach requires violating the law of non-contradiction, for not all sentences are not true and false. The two perspectives are jewels of each other, so one could not discriminate between them on the basis of logic alone. In fact, the duality can be seen in the structure of the logical rules each perspective allows. Here is the law of excluded middle, which is upheld in the inconsistent approach. A thing is A or not A. By negating the connective and then the entire rule, this becomes a thing is not A and not A. Now, the logical reason why we can't have a thing being both A and not A is that via syllogism we could then prove any statement. Consider the statement, A is true, or unicorns exist. Since A is true, and unicorns do not exist, A or unicorns exist is true. But now, not A is also true. So if A or unicorns exist, and not A, then unicorns exist. This is the principle of explosion. From a contradiction, everything follows. If a thing is A and not A, then a thing is B. This rule is clearly valid in both classical logic and the incomplete logic, but not in the inconsistent logic, and there is also a dual of this principle that is valid in inconsistent logics and not in incomplete ones. If we negate the rule and reverse the implication, 
if a and not a, then b, becomes if not a or not a, then not b. If a thing is neither a nor not a, then a thing is not b. This is simply the contraposition of what we can call the principle of implosion, which states that a or not a follows from any valid proposition. It is an expression of completeness. Now, the important point is that non-classical perspectives on logical consequence can be defined by the same structure and in the same way as all other philosophical notions. This can be brought out in several different ways. We can take as our two dichotomies, the four basic logical rules, the four elements of theoremhood, provability, non-provability, disprovability, and non-disprovability, or, if we are taking truth to be syntactical, by the four truth values, true, non-true, false, non-false. When properly elucidated, this provides us with an incredible realisation, which is this. That by which we discriminate is subject to the same structure of perspectives as that which it is used to discriminate between. In other words, the objective, mechanistic actuality of logic is conditioned in just the same way as the subjective, organic potentiality of human reason. To discriminate between the perspectives on discrimination would be to beg the question, and so we are forced to accept that arguing for an idea and against another is a fallacy, indefensibly illogical. Furthermore, the duality between completeness and consistency is not merely reflective of the duality between objective and subjective perspectives in philosophy, but also of the subject and object as regard our own experience as conscious beings. Consider again that certain statements we can see to be true cannot be produced by formal rules. Since the brain, at its lowest level, is merely a system of mechanisms, these mechanisms could be represented as a formal system, and this system will not be able to produce certain statements we can see to be true. By a loose analogy, the brain could never know that the statement, this statement is unknowable by the brain, is true, for if it were false, it would be knowably unknowable. The mind, being that which we are conscious of using to communicate with right now, can see it is true, however, and so the mind can do something which its brain cannot. Nevertheless, the mind is seemingly grounded in the brain and gains its power from it. There must be a systematic emergence between low-level physical hardware and high-level psychological software that permits the mind to deal with the kind of contradictions that no mechanism ever could. As such, the brain is related to consistency and the objectivist perspective as the mind is to completeness and the subjectivist perspective. An important question arises, what is related to the superjectivist perspective, which is built of the conflation of contradictory concepts? The answer to this question can be found in an analysis of the phenomenon of self-reference, which is precisely what necessitates the duality in logic. Recall, a self-referential system is a subject whose object is itself, or an object whose subject is itself. It is a union between the two basic aspects of extension, or action, or predication, or containment, or perception, subjectivity and objectivity. In self-reference, there is no distinction between them. It just so happens that there is an aspect of the mind-brain system a very important aspect, which is also self-referential, and that is, of course, self-consciousness itself, where we are not only conscious, but are conscious of being conscious. This is precisely what self-consciousness is. We are the subject of our own self-consciousness, and we are also its object, and so there is no self-consciousness without being subject and object, for consciousness is always the consciousness of something. In his 1979 classic Gödel Escher Bach, Douglas Hofstadter posited that self-consciousness is the result of a feedback loop between the physical hardware of the brain and the symbolic software of the mind, a feedback loop whose paradoxical structure is its very being. The self comes into being at the moment it has the power to reflect itself, he writes, like a self-referential statement that asserts its own truth, 
This idea is also remarkably similar to Johann Fichte's assertion that the self's own self-assertion is the logical foundation of all philosophy. The self posits itself, and by virtue of this mere self-assertion it exists. Its existence, a fact, is inseparable from its self-assertion, an act. It is the cause and effect of that act, just as it is the subject and the object. Philosophy generally is an ineluctably self-referential enterprise, for any complete, systematic philosophy will need to explain how itself came to be. Moreover, in the absence of any external first principles on which to ground philosophy, the philosopher can explain only how they conceive the world, and so any theory is a theory concerning oneself and one's capacity to conceive. We investigate our ability to investigate our ability to investigate, and we are, just like the basic modality of conscious thought, involved in a feedback loop with our theories. We form them, and they form us. Self-reference is at the core of all reason, and the union between subjectivity and objectivity, which is the essence of self-reference, is carried over into the fruits of our reason. It is thus that we find in any philosophic inquiry there is a perspective to be had which is innately self-contradictory when looked at from a classical viewpoint. If self-reference is central to the basic mechanism of thought, then it shall be central to any formalism thereof, and paraphilosophy gives us the tools to tackle it. The self-contradictory characterization of knowledge was the analytic a posteriori. Of being, it was the concrete universal, of value, the subjective absolute, and of right, libertarian collectivism. Far from being impossibilities of their respective notions, these concepts are the self-referential cause of them. Consider the analytic a posteriori, a proposition which is justified both by pure logic and by experience of the world. The only way that this is possible is if that experience of the world is precisely the logical proof of itself, or rather, if the justification via logic can never be carried out prior to experience. The fact must be one with the act, and the only proposition that this rightly refers to is the self's own assertion of itself, I exist. Furthermore, the concrete universal is an entity that is both spatio-temporal and yet common to all spatio-temporal things, and so the concrete universal is the universal of experience itself, for all things are united in the fact that we are conscious of them. The possibility of this notion of self-being is that which substantiates its own existence. It is the subject which is its own object, the I. It is what we all are, basically. Further still, the subjective absolute relies on our own innate goodness and knowledge of virtue. Self-value is the value of value itself, which, being the concrete universal, is also the nature of self, virtue, beauty, love. Finally, libertarian collectivism relies on each individual in a society being an ideal moral agent so that the governed may govern themselves. Thus, equality and liberty are united, for all individuals are free to indulge without limit, yet they choose to indulge in equality. The paradoxical positions in all areas of philosophy form a uniform and legitimate perspective that is a necessary element of the dialectical matrix. It is self-knowledge, self-being, self-value, and self-governance. When the subject is identified with its object, there is no contradiction in complementarity, and as all domains of knowledge are grounded in the distinction between subject and object, all domains of knowledge depend on the object that is subject to itself, and the witness of the subject-object relation. Now, how do we get from here to a science of philosophy? Well, first, we acknowledge that the dialectical matrix is syntheoretic with the structure of human experience, all the way down to the level of the relation between the mind and brain. We also understand that there is no logical reason to discriminate between the two sides of duality, and that multiple approaches to the very notions of logical consequence and truth itself may be valid simultaneously. 
Many logicians are already arguing for logical pluralism, the view that there are multiple valid deductive consequence relations, and some argue for truth predicate pluralism, that there is more than one valid definition of the notion of truth. Second, we understand that each element of the dialectical matrix is integrally related to one another, for each contains an aspect of another. In fact, the subjective and the objective can be constructed from the abjective and the superjective, just as a dialectical debate between two biases is born of the bifurcation of neutrality. Third, the structural similarity, or isomorphism, between the many expressions of the dialectical matrix enables the transfer of meaning between those expressions. It is generally accepted that isomorphism expresses an identity relation, and scale-invariant isomorphisms, fractals, contain this relation analytically. Most important, however, is the fact that the self-reflective aspect of the dialectical matrix, the superjective, is self-consciousness, and therefore that within which the dialectical matrix is expressed. Self-consciousness is both that within which the mind-brain relation is found, and also that which is born of this same relation. As such, it is both within and without itself, and so the dialectical matrix is a fractal within which itself, self-consciousness, can never be found. Since the dialectical matrix as a whole exists within that aspect of itself which is the superjective, the dialectical matrix as a whole is precisely the superjective looked at from a higher perspective. And given that the superjective, self-consciousness, is both an analytic principle and an empirical fact, that it is justified as actual through its own self-reference, that it is the union of subjectivity and objectivity, an act and a fact, the dialectical matrix too is justified as actual via the analytic a posteriori. It is the most basic, most known, most indisputable element of our efforts to understand the world and ourselves within it, and it is this fact on which para-philosophy is built. In fact, para-philosophy is just the dialectical matrix's own awareness of itself, and the possibility of its own self-conception is the certainty of its being. While traditional philosophy has attempted to explain what reality is like, thus assuming there is a way that it is like, Parapholosophy forces us to realise that reality is itself a manifestation of our own ability to explain our own ability to explain. Reality is a work in progress, and we are creating it by our very efforts to understand. We do not need to be convinced that parapholosophy is this marvellous play, for parapholosophy is that field within which we are convinced or unconvinced. It is the self-reference of potential. So now, what does all this mean? What are the solutions to philosophical questions? Parapholosophy describes the patterns through which the absolute reality of pure self-awareness becomes relativised in time into the duality of phenomenal experience. It is the experiencer that is evolving, and the domains of mind and matter are the two aspects of this experience. Ideals are therefore correlated with material things, as psychology is correlated with physics. There are no absolutely true philosophical theories because philosophic truth evolves just as we evolve. We are travelling a path in the structure of the full potential of truth, and so what is most true today at our current location on this path will be less true tomorrow, when we have moved further along. The pinnacle of the emergence of duality in the world is described by our most biased and one-sided theories what we might call reciprocal eliminativisms. For the realm of matter there shall be no trace of mind, and in the realm of mind there shall be none of matter. This also holds true for ethical principles and for systems of government. All philosophical notions are evolving towards their extremes, and of these extremes there are two. Philosophy struggles because to reconcile the halves of dualities we are forced to be moderate in our theories, we are intellectually attracted towards the abjective. This is the delusion of contradictory thinking, and we must exchange our monistic moderatism for a complementary extremism. Not only is this the solution to most of the major problems of philosophy, but it is also the solution to the problems of society. 
We must realise that liberty and equality are complementary ideals, demanding distinct political frameworks. Society must be, in a sense, severed in two, so that it may reflect the clear distinction between our subjective and objective worlds. We must realise that disparity is caused by governing two distinct structures with a single set of rules, by allowing luxuries and necessities to be governed by the same store of value, by allowing political agendas and moral virtue to be governed by the same system of laws. Our nature demands two extreme political frameworks that complement each other, one libertarian but unequal, and one egalitarian but unfree. This is the only way that we shall have either. Social evolution is a two-player game, and the keys to salvation lie in the hands of our opponents. Only when we recognise our other as necessary for our own persistence shall we move, on a collective level, beyond the logic of contradiction that has brought us thus far, to a new logic of complementarity, which will carry us into the future. Our whole reality is the pure activity and being of the concrete universal. This entity is what it is through becoming itself, for it is becoming itself. Change, duality, relativization are parts of the essence of the absolute, just as plurality and differentiation are parts of the essence of individuality. Our drive as individual beings to divide the world ever further by our concepts is an artefact of the division which was our birth, for discrimination shall be the wounder that heals. Reality is precisely the undoing of paradox. It is the untangling of self-reference, the separation of antinomies, and there is no cause for existence beyond the acquisition of harmony within potential. Evolution separates the subject from the object, and thus allows us to perceive our world as separate, but it shall also unite them again as we recognise our oneness with it. The extent of our understanding in here is always correlated with the extent of what there is to understand out there, for the two are not unlike. We create as we learn, we learn as we create, art and science are one in paraphilosophy, as are knowledge and truth, reason and reality. Our collective experience as living beings, past and future, is an exhaustive explanation of the nature of self-awareness, what it is, how it comes about, what it feels like. The explanation is one with the being, for self-awareness is only in so far as it is aware of what, how, and why it is. Its being is its reason. That is, the nature of our being is our reason for being. Everything is self, and there is a definite destination for our experience as living beings, and it is the absolute knowledge of I. The sensual realisation of paraphilosophy is thus a realisation concerning the nature of self. We are not empty vessels needing to fill our minds with concepts. We are not blind wanderers searching for an outside truth. All philosophic ideas are true, insofar as they have been thought true, and we are exploring the full extent of the idea of the idea in our pretending ideas can be false. Pretending, of course, is good. Acting, playing. It is pretending that one is not pretending which creates our problems, for this is no longer playful. Paraphilosophy will teach us that absence is the source of all presence, for it is the absence of a way things are which fuels the creativity, the capacity to be any way. Creativity is peace. It is not being. It is not believing. And the ultimate truth of paraphilosophy is creativity. It is the absence of an absolute truth, which is itself absolutely true. It is a paradox to the very core. It is not something I can ever get across fully with the rational mind, but as we learn more about what it is that paraphilosophy is saying, we shall develop a new kind of common sense regarding the absolute unity of being and non-being. So, what is paraphilosophy? It is nothing. It is the pattern potential patterns itself when there is no particular pattern the pattern must be, but that is also what beauty is. It is not needing to be a certain way, but being that way anyway. It is the inexplicable tendency for order in randomness. And so, there is nothing to learn. There is no enlightenment. There is only liberation from our delusion there is. 
There is only the unlimited peace that not seeking provides. There is only oneness, love, and the momentary blindness thereof. There is only the enjoyment of the art. There is only creativity, and it is all I. The empty is full, and you can see the trick. It only takes a moment. There is nothing to find. There is no one to find it. There is only the wisdom of silence.